Howdy, welcome to the Breakaway Podcast. This is the final microcast in the Gospel of Mark series. Uh, we've been doing these to kind of catch up, fill in on some parts of Mark that we didn't cover on a Tuesday night. And uh, if you've been tracking with us, there's a big chunk here we skipped, uh, and that is chapter 13, the whole chapter. And it's uh, Mark only has two major teaching uh, sections of Jesus, like major dialogue sections, and we skipped one. And so you go, Ben, that is horribly irresponsible as a teacher. What is your problem? Well, I'll tell you. Um, this discourse in chapter 13 is called the Olivet Discourse. Uh, Jesus will give it on the Mount of Olives, and it is, um, uh, in many ways, his his eschatological treatise. I mean, he lays out um, how this is going to go, and uh, we did so much of that in the fall with First Thessalonians. In in a lot of ways, First Thessalonians is a commentary on this, and so I felt like, okay, we're going to have to cut things. This is something we could cut because we kind of did it through the lens of Paul, we looked at this. So that's my excuse. But for those of you who still say, Ben, that's not good enough, then you stay tuned because here it comes, uh, the Olivet Discourse, uh, which I will just say right now is one of the most complex um, elements in the teachings of Jesus because what's going to happen as we look at this together in these few minutes is Jesus is going to start by talking about the destruction of the temple. In the last podcast, we talked about how he tells them, hey, this whole structure uh, is not pleasing to God. And what's he going to do? He is going to punish the tenants of this vineyard and give the vineyard to others. And he's letting you know, this system of worship is over. I'm setting up a new one. And the stone that you rejected will become the cornerstone of a new temple. That's Jesus's prophecy and the one that they will get him killed. Um, But then after that, he'll break into this, where it starts about the destruction of the temple. And some people think all this is about is the destruction of the temple, that Jesus is prophesying it, and it happened 40 years later in AD 70. Uh, I'm not one of those, because as Jesus talks, he starts talking about the return of the Son of Man with great authority, and it starts to sound more like the era of final and decisive judgment. But the reality is it's one conversation And so the idea of him talking about two different events separated by time, the destruction of the temple in AD 70, and then the end of days, the final judgment, all in one conversation, some people go, no, it's one thing, Ben, it's the AD 70. Some people go, no, it's all the end times. And some people take a place in the middle. And so it ends up with a very exciting, robust debate, tons of fun. And we won't get into all of it because we will be here late into the evening. But I'll just give you kind of a cursory sketch through it. And I'll lay my cards on the table up front. I think what you're going to see here is Jesus starts talking about the destruction of the temple, and then he uses it as a pattern to discuss what's going to happen at the end of days. Because uh, that's a rhythm you see in a lot of Jewish literature. You see it in the Old Testament too. The prophets would speak of the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord meant a day of judgment. And so there were days of the Lord. Locusts came and ate their crops. Uh, a foreign power would come and wipe out Israel. And the prophets would call it the day of the Lord. And yet as they talked about it, you would see that little fulfillment back there of the quote day of the Lord, but it also pictured a bigger day of the Lord later, the final decisive day of the Lord that would come. And I think that's what Jesus is doing here. There is a judgment that is going to come on this temple and in Jerusalem, and it's a pattern, a picture of a bigger judgment that's going to come uh, at the end of days. And so that's enough precursor, but let me jump into this. This is Jesus' longest speech in Mark, and it is is an intense condemnation uh, of the current system, and I think it's going to give us a window into what we can expect in the age to come. So chapter 13, verse one says this, and as he came out of the temple, now you remember the temple, they've had that big argument in the temple and it culminated with him saying, this is being rejected and I'm building a new temple. And uh, Paul keys off that language in Ephesians, first Peter, that we are the new spiritual stones being built into a spiritual temple being built off Christ. And yet, as he's walking out of the temple with his disciples, it says, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And I always wondered about that. They're walking out and his disciples go, look, Jesus, what wonderful buildings. And I'm like, he went to the temple as a kid, Luke told us. He knows what the temple looks like. 
why are, suddenly are they like, Jesus, look at this building? You know, like he's going to be like, yeah, we've been here. I know. What is going on? Well, what was going on was Herod was massive into building. And he built whole cities and built all manner of monuments. And all through his reign, Herod was adding to the temple. And by this time in Jesus's life, he had taken the temple and made it larger than Solomon's temple in the Old Testament, the one that was destroyed. And he made it ornate and massive. And Josephus and Tacitus tell us it was one of the greatest buildings of the ancient world. It was huge. Several football fields, gold everywhere. It was ornate. It was a sight to behold. Uh, And it dominated the skyline in Jerusalem. And so these guys are like, Jesus, get a load of this. This is nuts, man. This is unbelievable. Um, And Jesus responds in verse two and says, and he said to them, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So they're enamored by the building and Jesus goes, guys, don't put a lot of stock in it. This whole thing is going down. And not only does he say this whole thing's going down, he says not one stone will be left on top of another. And that actually is exactly what happened 40 years later. Uh, It's interesting. We talked about it in the last sermon. Uh, when Jesus is put up on trial against Barabbas, they're given two different messiahs. Do you want Jesus or do you want Barabbas who was willing to kill an insurrection? And the Jewish people say, we want Barabbas. We want the, the military leader who wants to overthrow Rome. And the reality is that becomes the dominant theme in Jewish history. We Christians kind of leave off. We read the book of Acts and then we go to our church and we go, we jump straight here and we kind of leave history. And uh, in history, you see the Jewish people more and more begin to push back against Rome. And finally, Jerusalem, they lead a coup against Rome. And Rome comes in AD 70, they destroyed Jerusalem. They crucified hundreds of Jewish people. They burned the city. They burned down Herod's temple. And the gold, it was burned so intensely, the gold in the temple melted. And so they would push the stones on top of each, off each other to get to the gold. They literally fulfilled what Jesus prophesied here 40 years earlier, that not one stone will be on top of another. They leveled Jerusalem. This was a, a horrible, horrible thing that happened to Jerusalem. And... Uh, And it was awful. And that was the end of that city. But Christianity, as you read the book of Acts, was already spreading and moving. And Jerusalem was no longer even the center of the Christian life. But anyway, I digress. So Jesus tells them, don't get too attached to it. It's all going down. And so verse 3, it says, And he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the signs when all these things are about to be accomplished? And so what they're saying to him is, okay, this whole thing's going down. When's that going to happen? And what will be the signs when all these things are about to be accomplished? Now, that's the big debate in theological circles, the all these things. Because in the book of Matthew, Matthew records that as they're asking him this, they say, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the signs of your coming and the completion of the age? And so in Matthew, you get the sense that they're asking two things. When is the temple going down? And what will be the signs of the end of the age? And so it's sort of like two different questions. Um, Although I don't think they had a picture of Jesus dying, coming back in a second coming. They didn't have that uh, comprehensive a Christian worldview yet. This is all stuff they figured out later. But they knew the Messiah would come to judge Jerusalem, and they're just asking him, give us clarity on this. But I think what you're seeing happen here is all three synoptics have these things. Tell us about the destruction of the temple and tell us about events connected to it. And I think Jesus takes that and op- that opens up a conversation about the future. And so Jesus begins to tell them things uh, that precede the end, is what he'll call it. Uh, So in verse five, it says, and Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. And these are but the beginnings of the birth pains. And so I think at this point, Jesus is already transitioning from talking about the destruction of the temple to the ultimate fulfillment of God's judgment of the world, because he starts using this massive stuff of nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Uh, He's talking about international chaos, 
multiple nations warring against each other. This is suddenly bigger as as horrible and uh, as the destruction of Jerusalem was, this is suddenly becoming bigger than that. And I think he's using the destruction of Jerusalem as a picture of the end of the age. Uh, and so how do we know the end is coming? Uh, it's interesting. He starts to tell them false Christs will come. Uh, there will be wars and rumors of wars, and there'll be international chaos. There'll be political and national disaster is what he says. That's how you know. But then he says, but the end is not yet. These are but the beginning. And so the interesting thing about that is some people will look at that and they go, look at all the wars. We're at the end times. Look at all the earthquakes. This is the end. But you see Jesus goes, you'll see earth, you'll see wars, not the end yet. You'll see earthquakes. That's just the beginning. And so he's very indefinite about the timing. So people who look at those things and go, the time is here. He says, no, that's just the start of a long and painful period. Uh, it's the beginning of the march to the end. So when you see these things, you're not supposed to think the end is near. You're supposed to think the end is starting. Anyway, uh, verse 9. <clears throat> but be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils. You will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witnesses before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all the nations. See, there again, he's telling them things that sound like what's going to happen directly to them. But then he says the gospel will be preached to all nations and and that that doesn't sound like AD 70. Um, and so some people can find a, a, a near fulfillment in that, maybe the book of Acts when all these different nations are present. But again, I think his language here is bigger. He's using the destruction of Jerusalem to picture a final decisive day. And he says the gospel will go to all nations before that final day comes. Uh, verse 11, and when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And that's serious language, again, for this day, and I think a further fulfillment for the day to come. He's saying, your association with me will cost you, and it may even cost within your family. Not may, it will. And some of you know that feeling of your association with Christ has caused alienation in your family. He says that will come. What's interesting is Jesus doesn't apologize for that. He says, yeah, and it will be hard. It will be very hard. But you endure. You endure to the end. Uh, but then he goes on, and here's where it gets weird. Uh, verse 14, he says, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not, standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And you go, what is that? Well, Matthew is more direct. It says the desolating sacrilege spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. Uh, Daniel chapter nine uh, prophesies an act of desecration in the holy temple. Uh, and something like that happened under Antiochus Epiphanes in 167 BC. Antiochus Epiphanes was a terrible guy, and uh, the Jewish people were celebrating that he was dead because uh, he was a wicked ruler. Turned out he wasn't dead. He showed up, obviously wasn't invited to the party, found out it was a, you're dead. We thought you were dead, and we were happy about it party. Hurt his feelings. The guy was a nutcase, uh, and he went into the temple and, I mean, he uh, slaughtered pigs in the Holy of Holies just to desecrate the temple. I mean, it was awful. And they called it, in that sense, you see Daniel prophesying that this will happen, a desecration of the Holy of Holies by a guy that as Daniel describes him, you go, that's Antiochus. And Daniel is prophesying the future. It's pretty eerie how much he nails something that will come generations later. And yet... Daniel prophesies that short-term fulfillment in Tychus Epiphanes. That's a picture of a later fulfillment that 1 Thessalonians will grab, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians, says it will be an abomination of desolation, just like Daniel said, just like Antiochus did. And again, you see this little fulfillment, bigger fulfillment, and that kind of rhythm is all through uh, biblical prophecy. And so Jesus says this moment's going to come where you see a desolation in the temple and when that comes, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one 
who is on the housetop not go down, not enter his house to take anything out, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to get his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter, which is again that he says that. Again, there's a lack of definiteness about the end day. For in those days there will be such tribulation as as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. Again, that language is so big, you go, he can't just be talking about AD 70. I mean, AD 70 was bad. What happened to Jerusalem was awful. And again, we underestimate it or skip it entirely. And yet he says, this tribulation will be so bad, it will be worse than any difficulty that has ever been in creation until now or ever will be. And you go, Jesus is using this short thing to talk about this later thing. And he says, and if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he has shortened the days. And so I think what he's saying there is, again, there will be a horrible day for Jerusalem. And it came in AD 70. And yet there will be a later day coming where God's judgment will fall upon the earth. And he says, you will run for your lives and If the wrath of God was poured out in its fullest, no one would survive. But for the sake of calling people out to himself, God will shorten the days of of destruction. Verse 21, and then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, there he is, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Be on your guard. I've told you this beforehand. So if anyone ever comes to you and says they're Jesus, don't believe them. If they ever come to you and say, I'm the Christ, don't believe them. So whatever town they're in, whatever miracles they perform, Jesus is telling you now, if someone shows up and says, I'm Jesus, don't buy it. Uh, But he goes on. It says, but in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the son of man coming in clouds with great power and glory. So when some guy... And Waco says, I'm Jesus, don't buy it. But when the sun goes dark and stars fall out of the sky and you see the son of man riding on the clouds, that's Jesus is what he's saying. It will be fairly obvious. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. And again, that language is so much bigger than AD 70. The son of man is coming back to gather his people at the end of the days. And some people look at that And they go, well, that's just symbolic language. This was all about AD 70. And, um, you know, that just means creation's going to go nuts. And you go, well, no, because all through the early church, um, they believed the promise in Acts chapter 1, where Jesus ascended into heaven and they said, he will come back just as he left. And so all through the early church, they knew about the destruction of Jerusalem. Everybody knew. And yet they would read this and say, this is talking about a future day where the Son of Man returns in glory to gather his elect. And they longed for that day. And I think we're meant to as well. So again, this is a complex sermon, but I think it's pointing to a near fulfillment and a far one. Have I said that already? I think I have. All right. Uh, We're almost done. Hang in there. Verse 28. From the fig tree learn its, its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Uh, Again, he says, when you see this is happening, know it's near. There's an indefinite to it, indefiniteness. You don't know the date. And yet there's an anticipation. Know that he's near. And that's really at the end of the day, if you can remember that, people say, when's the end of days coming? Jesus says, it'll be crazy obvious. You'll see cosmic signs and I'll appear in the heavens. That's when you know the world's over. All right. Everything else is just the beginning. Uh, But he says here, there's an indefiniteness to the day where you're not sure, but we're meant to have an anticipation for the day. Like you look at a fig tree and you see it's got leaves, you know, figs are coming. He says, when you see earthquakes and these things, it's just the beginning. You don't know when the end is coming, but it should increase your anticipation. You know, that's the idea. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, that is the controversial statement. What does he mean by that? Because some people see that and he goes, he was saying he was going to return in their lifetime, and he didn't, so Jesus is a liar. But no one in the church ever read it that way. And so 
if they weren't bothered by it, what's going on here? Well, there's a bunch of different options as to how to understand that. What does it mean? Some people are saying, when he says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place, what he's saying is, hey, those of you who are alive now, everything I've just told you about before this point, earthquakes, rumors of war, persecution, nations fighting nations, you'll all be alive to see stuff like that. And what that means is, the next date on the calendar is my return. But that doesn't mean the return. He's just saying these things, the, the putting out of the leaves and that you know summer is near. And so it sounds like what he's saying to them is all these things that show you the beginning of the end is coming, you'll see. But he's not telling them they'll see the end. If you notice, he's attached that to this story about seeing the leaves come on the fig tree. You know summer's near, but it's not here yet. And so all the signs that let you know the end is near, you guys will see, but you won't see the end uh, because that's when he moves on and says, nobody knows when it's coming. And so that's one way to read it. Uh, another way to read it is the generation that sees all these things beginning will also see the end of it. So when he says this generation, he doesn't mean the one that's sitting there in front of him. He means the generation that sees the beginning of these things will also see the end of these things. Uh, or a third way to look at it is um, to kind of rethink the word generation means a long period of time or something. I never really understood that one. I don't know. Uh, so honestly, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think there's probably value to option one. You guys are going to see the beginnings. You guys are going to see the beginnings of birth pains, uh, but they won't see the end. That's going to come later. I think contextually, as you see it play out, that's what he's saying. The leaves, the beginning of birth pangs, you guys will see. And so you'll know the end is near. And so you're meant to anticipate it. And yet, verse 32, but concerning the day or the hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. But be on guard and keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts a servant in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. And so that's where he ends. Uh, again, I think he's prophesying the, the last days, and it's a message to us. And what's the message? Do we know when the return of Christ and the end of history will be. We don't. And he's very certain in here to say, any signs you see will show you it's just the beginning, but the actual date, nobody knows. So if anyone ever writes a book that says when he's coming back, it's 2012, it's whatever, don't believe him. Uh, he says, you don't know. And so forget about it. And yet we're supposed to grip. There's an indefiniteness, but an anticipation. I don't know the day, but I know it's coming. Like pregnancy. If I see my wife's belly growing, I know she's about to have a baby. But do I know the exact day? No. So there's indefiniteness, but anticipation. And he says, that's how we're meant to see Jesus coming again. We're not sure, but we know it's coming. And he says, as sure as you will see these signs begin, and they saw them, these signs begin, the destruction of the temple, earthquakes, rumors of war, as sure as that happens, surely you will see me come. And so if you saw that, believe this is coming. And the appropriate response is to stay awake. Be like the servant who's ready when their master comes home. And that's the call to us. We live like this is not all there is. We live knowing there's a day coming. And so we leverage out our money. We leverage out our time. We leverage out everything we have here to prepare our neighbors, our friends, our families for the day that's to come. And so we sell our possessions and give to the poor. So we preach Christ and his rescue and redemption to all. And we stay awake and we stay ready, knowing that he'll come. And so we go about the business that he cared about. That's how you stay ready, is you do what you know the master would like, which is to love people sacrificially until the day he comes to gather his elect from the four winds. So anyway, that's chapter 13. And uh, thank you guys for hanging in there. This was a tough one. But uh, if you want to read further, if you're one of those people, uh, Three Views of the Millennium and Beyond by Daryl Bach will get you deep into eschatology of the Olivet Discourse. 
And you can read all about the end of the world from people who can talk about it responsibly. So anyway, blessings to you. Take it easy. We'll see you next week.